The other thing is that Chapter 8 covers both negotiable and non-negotiable transport documents. You'll see the terminology. Bills of lading are dead. So are seaway bills, so are all of the other creatures you're familiar with. This generic transport document is the only. So there are only two types, negotiable and non-negotiable transport documents, and then I guess electronic transport records that, that correspond to them. Um, so that may simplify things. It may get rid of all of these arguments about what is a straight bill of lading, is it a way bill or is it a non-negotiable bill of lading. We'll just say, look, it's a transport document. If it says it's negotiable, it's negotiable. If it says it's non-negotiable, it's non-negotiable. Okay, Articles 35 to 38 set out the information requirements that need to be on these transport documents. Again, very much more detailed than Haig um, and Haig Visby and much more modernised. So it deals in a lot more depth about the information the shipper has to provide on the bill of lading. Again, some commentators have said this is a bit too much bureaucracy, but it probably reflects modern practice more accurately than the Hague and Hague Visby rules did. Okay, one last one, and then I think we'll have a bit of a break. Um, the other major change is to the list of defences. The list of defences is in Article 17 of the Rotterdam Rules. You, you'll be familiar already, um, Professor Tyne will have told you about the long shopping list of defences under the Hague and Hague Visby Rules. Good old Article 4.2, yes, 17 I think from memory. Well we've trimmed it down. Under Rotterdam it's now 50. This was a cause of huge debate as to whether they should go with Hamburg and totally remove the exemptions of liability. So basically just say, as they do in Hamburg, the carrier is liable for any loss caused by its fault. The feeling was that that would be too controversial and too radical a change. Uh, the common law countries in particular were not comfortable with that as being too generic. So what they did is they stuck with the shopping list but they removed some of the elements which have been highly controversial. And the most controversial one probably is, is 42A, the so-called nautical fault defence, which exempts the carrier from liability for loss or damage from the act, neglect or default of the master, mariner, pilot or the servants of the carrier in the navigation or in the management of the ship. Um, the Rotterdam rules now expressly state that the carrier is liable for all negligent acts of the master and the crew. So that's going to make a major difference in terms of these cases. Now, why do I say it's a good thing? I say it's a good thing because the nautical fault defence might have made sense in the 19th century when shipping companies couldn't communicate with their vessels when they were at sea and therefore had no control over what their masters were doing. They'd only hear about it afterwards. So it seemed fair that they shouldn't be liable if their master suddenly had a brainstorm and took a shortcut and went across some rocks. In the 21st century, though, we know these shipping companies are in complete communication with their vessels at all times. It seems unreasonable to give them a complete exemption of liability, given that they've picked the master, they've trained the master, or at least they're happy that he's been trained properly, and they should therefore be responsible. Um, I was recently involved in some litigation in New Zealand, a case called the Tasman Pioneer, which put me off Article 42A for life. I'll just briefly tell you the, the facts of the story. Um, this was carriage from Auckland via Yokohama in Japan through to Pusan in South Korea. After Yokohama, the master realized that he was late and that he wouldn't make it on the tide through the, the, the various channels he had to get through to get to Korea. So he decided to take a shortcut. And he took a shortcut around the other side of a Japanese island that he wasn't supposed to, and he tore the vessel open. Having realized this, instead of giving a May Day signal, the master instructed the crew to erase the charts and change the navigation so that it showed that they'd gone around the other side of the island, and then immediately steamed, full steam ahead, around the island to try and get back to the normal shipping lane so that he could cover up what he'd done. 
other vessels noticed that there was this container vessel steaming like this at full speed with the back going further and further down and um, rang up the Coast Guard and said, excuse me, I think we've got a bit of a problem here. So the Japanese Coast Guard eventually nabbed him and he said, no, no, well, I went around the island that way and it's just bad luck, but you can't fool the Japanese Coast Guard. They took samples of the rocks that they found in the gash underneath the vessel and they sent divers down around all the islands until they matched up the rock. And they said, we know where you were and we know what you did to the ship. So we had perfect evidence of what he'd done and that he'd been covering up his tracks. Now, the cargo claimant's argument was, okay, act, neglect, or default of the master. All right, so his original grounding was negligent. We're fine with that. But we could prove that if he'd then put in a mayday, there were three ships standing by who would have been able to assist and there was a lot of salvage services available. The containers would have been perfectly fine. There would have been no damage to any of the cargo on board. It was his deliberate conduct in covering up his own wrongdoing that actually caused the loss. So we said that the cause was not actually the act neglect or the fault of the master. The master was acting in bad faith and was trying to protect himself. So that took it outside of 42A. Well, we won in the High Court, we won in the New Zealand Court of Appeal, we lost in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said basically anything that the Master does, short maybe of sleepwalking, falls within 42A. So I for one won't be sorry to see 42A go. I think it's, it's a grossly unfair and outdated uh, exception. Okay, in terms of other exemptions, the list has also been updated to include not only war, but now also terrorism, which is very important, uh, and also reasonable measures to avoid or attempt to avoid damage to the environment. So if you do deviate from your course to attempt to help with a, a, a clean-up, a spill, for example, or stop one from happening, then you're exempt from liability. Um, so basically, we've retained the list shortened it down and updated it. Okay, so, um, and again, if you're a carrier, you may not think this is a good thing. Um, I'm looking at it more from an academic perspective. Uh, the second big change that the Rotterdam Rules makes in terms of carrier liability is it extends the seaworthiness obligation. You'll already be fully familiar with the fact that under Hague and hague Bisby. Um, the seaworthiness obligation only applied to the beginning of the voyage. Um, there was no ongoing commitment to provide a seaworthy vessel. Um, under the Rotterdam rules, the carrier is liable for any consequences caused by unseaworthiness of the ship at any stage of the voyage. So it now covers the entire voyage. Or improper crewing, equipping or supplying the ship and that's Article 14 read together with Article 17. So the obligation for seaworthiness is expressed in similar terms to Hague and Hague Visby, but it's extended. And if the carrier can show that there was unseaworthiness at any stage on the voyage, um, it will be able to apply for compensation under the Rotterdam rules. Another controversial development is that for the first time the Rotterdam rules covers uh, loss, not only loss or damage of goods, but also delay of goods. Um, Hagen Hag does be only covered loss or physical damage. The Rotterdam rules extends that to cover delay and delivery. In case you're not sure what delay and delivery is, Article 21 rather um, unnecessarily, I think, described it as occurring when goods are not delivered at the place of destination provided for in the contract of carriage within the time agreed. Now, again, uh, carriers are not going to like this, but the feeling of the drafters was that most international trade law is now done in a just-in-time fashion, and that often delay in delivery of the goods is as damaging to the consignee as their physical loss um, or uh, you know, damage caused to them. So the idea was that um, 
we have to bring delay into it. I also note that it does bring uh, sea carriage of goods in line with other international transport conventions, particularly in uh, carriage of goods by air. The Warsaw and Montreal conventions apply for liability for delay. So it's, it's not an outlandish experiment. It is to be found in other conventions. It's just that the maritime conventions are so old, they haven't caught up. So uh, that's another innovation which carriers are unlikely to embrace, but um, looking at it from a broader perspective, it may be a good thing.